Well, good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. It's, it's lovely to see you in church this morning. Hope you're okay. Are, are you all okay this morning? All ready to, uh, to worship God? Do you know, it, it's really good, isn't it, to come to church? Really good to come to church. Oh, why on earth have you come if it isn't that good? It's, you know, we could be in a football match and the, the, the teams could come out. And do you know when the teams come out, and I think we should try this in Bethany, when we've been praying in there and Ron and Ken and myself and a few others come out, when the football team comes out, what do the crowd do? They cheer, don't they? They cheer with excitement and expectancy. That, But you shouldn't be cheering me. All the elders, you should be cheering God. And you should be coming into church and cheering and saying, yes! Yes! We're coming into God's presence. God is here, yes! And you know when your football team comes out, I have this all every week, we're full of hope. We're full of expectancy. We're full of, it's going to be the week. And I'm, not, I'm always let down. But do you know when we come into church and we come and meet with God and we come into His presence, do you know what? It's not just what if or we hope it will. God always turns up. And the presence and power of God is always here. But do you know what the problem is? I'll tell you what the problem is. I'm going to tell you straight this morning, because I'm in that sort of mood. Do you know what the problem is? You. Do you know what the biggest problem is? Me. The problem isn't with God. The problem isn't with what breakfast you've had, or what, whether the sun is shining, or whether it, whether it isn't. The problem is whether you, this morning, want to connect with the holy, awesome, creator God. And I hope you do. Because you've wasted a pound for the offering. And you've wasted a couple of hours of your day. So please come on. When we come into church. Praising you heavens and all that's above. Praising you angels and heavenly hosts. us, however we might feel this morning, whether our head might be pounding, whether our body might be aching. Lord, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. We thank you for your compassion. Father God, I pray that as we worship you this morning, as we praise you this morning, that this act will be an overflow of our feelings in our hearts towards you. Father God, I just thank you for church. And I thank you for this opportunity for us all to come together and worship you. Lord, may it be a real uh, flow to the meeting this morning. And may we really experience your presence in our lives. Encourage us, dear God, and challenge us as well. We pray this in your holy name. Your presence. 
Okay, let's pray for the children. Father God, we thank you for the children, every single one of them. Uh, we pray that you'll uh, be with them, that you'll help them, that you'll encourage them. And Lord, as they go into their groups, I pray that they will, uh, if they feel a little bit nervous or uh, whatever, I pray that you will just calm those nerves and that they'll know that they'll be uh, accepted and uh, shown lots and lots of care in their little groups. Lord, we thank you for the teachers. And we pray that the teachers will speak uh, well to them and speak very, very clearly in all Heavenly that they Father, do and all that they say. Thank you for this morning. We pray this in your holy name. We've just Amen. sung those amazing words, Hungry I Come. But Father God, there was a line that really stood out to me that your touch restores my life. Father God, I pray that this morning that um, what we hear from you that your touch will restore our lives. Every day we need restoration. And Father, people look for it in all sorts of different things. They look for it in Botox. <laughs> they look for it in uh, money. They look for it in every single thing we can imagine. But Lord, we know that you are the only one that can restore us into the people that you long for us to be. Father God, I pray that my words that aren't from you, that people will forget. But the things that come from you, Father God, I pray that you'll really impress them on our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, please, I pray that you'll help me not to dry up because of nerves or that my head won't go blank because it feels really blank right now. In Jesus' name, I ask it for your glory and not for myself. Amen. Okay, sit down. <laughs> want to sit. What? <laughs> okay, here it goes. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I was in hospital for a short time a few weeks ago, and I really enjoyed it. It was a bit painful, but I really enjoyed it because it really gave me chance to think. 
And I was looking at this time that I'd be off work and all the stuff going on, that it would be a chance for it to be like a God holiday, like me and God. And it's been really, really good. But I really feel that God placed something on my heart when I was in hospital. I didn't know that that John would say that he wanted me to speak. But I guess God knows what's happening before it actually happens. So that's really good. But I was thinking while I was in hospital a bit about history. We were talking this morning and Darren said he loves the history books in the Old Testament. He really enjoys those. But we sometimes like a little bit of history. And there's one thing that's common to every single living person. We all have a history. And that history can be good, it can be bad, and it can be ugly, and everything else in between. But when I was there, I I remembered something that happened to me as a child, which was that which I'd completely forgotten about. And I remember that as a little girl on a Sunday morning, I would call for my friend, Valerie Hua, who lived three doors up. And I was about seven, so it seems quite young to be going to church on your own, but those days, things seemed pretty safe. And we'd go really early. I don't know why, but that sort of pattern seems to have continued because I still come to church quite early. And we'd set off, I'd call for her and we'd set off, and the distance from our church from home was from about here to perhaps Castle Park School. So it was a fair distance, and we had one road to cross, which wasn't busy, especially on a Sunday morning. And my chapel was a big old Victorian chapel, and we'd head off, we'd cross the road, and we'd push open those big raw iron gates, and we'd walk up the steps, and then we'd have to go on tiptoes, because the They had double doors to the church, wooden doors, heavy doors, which had one of those old-fashioned latches. And I can remember, this all came flooding back. I'd be there, and we'd reach up, and we'd go in, and it'd just be the two of us. We'd worked out when other people went, and we made sure we were there before. I don't know why, but you know those old churches had a beautiful thing about them. They had a smell. You know, you never forget the smell of somewhere. And it was the smell of varnish and wood and old. It was gorgeous, but there was something really warm about it. And we'd go in and we'd pick up our hymn books. Those were the days when you still had a hymn book. But it was what happened next that I'd forgotten. I'd head off. I don't know what happened to Valerie. I can't remember anything about what happened to Barry, but I remember setting off down the aisle of the church. And the church was huge, and especially when you're small, it seems much bigger. But I had a huge balcony that went all the way around. And I'd make my way to the front. And then we had a huge pulpit, nothing like these little dirty things we've got in this church. And the pulpit was so big and ornate and all carved out of wood and it had steps either side and beautiful um, velvet curtain, navy. And the carpet, the things you remember, navy and bright blue carpet looked really lush. And I'd walk up those stairs that I'd never would have done if people had been in the church. And when I got to the top, I'd kneel down forgotten all about this I knelt down and I did something which was really unusual because it was a Baptist church it wasn't Catholic or Church of England I crossed myself I don't know what it meant and then I'd pray now sometimes I'd pray the Lord's Prayer because I thought that's what you had to do but sometimes I prayed whatever and then I'd make my way back but I wondered why did I cross myself and I remembered I'd watched a film And it was about a nun. Now, I know there's a film called The Nun Story, and I don't know if it was that one, but it was about this woman who'd given up everything to follow Jesus. She'd given up love for a man. She'd given up her family. And she'd gone to follow this call that was on her life. And I must have seen her cross herself, and that's the only reason why I did it. But I was thinking this morning that we all have a history And it's really great to have a God that no matter what our history, God can forgive us of it. 
It doesn't matter whether it was good, a good history or a bad history or what even your history was like yesterday. God wants to forgive. I want you to just turn to your Bibles and we're in the Old Testament this morning. And it's Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And I know that some of you will be able to quote this verse off by heart, but there'll be some of you that this will be fresh, this will be new. And the verse is this. I'm sorry, I don't know what number it is in the, the Bible. But it's just one verse. And God says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. What a fabulous verse. So many of us in the past have clung to that verse, but let's have a, just a quick look at a bit of the history behind it. Jeremiah was a prophet, and he was called by God at a young age to become prophet, to speak up on God's behalf, not just to one or two people or a small church, but towards a nation. And uh, when we look at Jeremiah 1, we see that he said he couldn't do it. He was young. Who's going to listen to him? But God said he'd be with him. Jeremiah wasn't a popular chap. As you can imagine, if you're going to speak God's word, sometimes you're not the popular person. He wasn't successful in the world's eyes. He was poor. He was thrown into prison. He was beaten. He was taken to Egypt against his will. And yet he still spoke up for God. But you see, he may not have been successful in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, he was really successful. He stood for what he knew to be true, no matter what the cost. And to God, he was a hero. I have to say this morning that we put so much onto pe what people think of us. But so often we fail because we fail to look at what God thinks of us. Uh, this particular verse is very important, an important part of the life of John and I. And um, I know the ladies like a love story. And I think some of you blokes do as well. So I'm going to tell you a little story, a bit of a background story, a bit of history, a bit about John and myself. <laughs> I've got to drink something, I'm drying up. I became a Christian at the um, uh, ripe old age of 15. Uh, I, um, I was an only child and... Um, been going to church a very long time and as you all know and kids as I tell you on a Sunday going to church isn't what makes you a Christian it's what happens in here that makes you a Christian so at 15 I became a Christian at 16 I had my first boyfriend and at 17 I got engaged that'll surprise some of you it's the truth some of us have a not so pleasant history at 18, it was all over. <laughs> and I, I've got to say, I'll lay my cards on the table, it was my fault that it was over. Because I thought I loved him. But my mum said something really profound to me after it finished, and I had to be the one to finish it, because I realised I was living a lie. That I liked him... But I realized I didn't love him, and if I went ahead and married him, then I wouldn't just be lying to him. I'd be making vows to God that was a lie. And so I did, for me, it was a really hard thing because the person you see today isn't the person you would have seen back in history. I was very shy. I was very scared. People didn't even notice sometimes that I was around because I liked to f 
fade into the background. So for me to say it's over was very, very difficult. And I was afraid of what people thought. But I think in my heart, I was more afraid of what God thought of me if I did the wrong thing. But my mum said something profound. She said, Jack, I think you were in love with being in love. And I think she was true. And I think sometimes a lot of us, at whatever age, make that mistake. We love the feeling of being wanted and being needed. Well, anyway, seven years passed. Seven years in a young person's life is a long time. And in that time, I had one boyfriend. And uh, it didn't last very long either. And as I was getting older, I was getting more desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I felt lonely. At this time in my Christian life, in my church, in my little Baptist chapel called Ebenezer, in a little place called St. Henneth, I was the young people. It was me. <laughs> and it was a very lonely place to be. But I knew I couldn't go anywhere else because that's where God wanted me at that time. So I stuck it out. But uh, by this time, I was mobile hairdressing after working in Cardiff for a number of, for eight years. And I was mobile hairdressing. And it was a great refuge, my car, because it was where I had my quiet time. And I had um, numerous times where I'd have the, my tape player on in those days, and I'd be listening to songs and singing my heart out and praying. But this one particular day... And I think it's brilliant how God speaks to us. A song came to my head, which I don't really like. It's a bit boring, really. But it's, um, it's a chorus. And, but a lot of you may really like it. And I'm really sorry, but it's just me. And the words came flooding into me. And it was these words. And it was, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And... God got my attention. You see, the thing was, is that I'd become desperate about a man or a, a boyfriend, but not desperate for God. And the desperation for a man had overtaken my desperation for God, and that's never a good thing. We can put anything in front of God, and it becomes our idol. And this had become my idol. And God, in his beautiful way, was telling me, put me first, seek me first. And all these things will be added unto you. But put him first. And young people, class, <laughs> it's a real lesson. Don't put other things in front of God because it never works. It, it's doomed for failure. It might succeed for a while. But we need to be putting God as number one in our lives. And so I did it. And I realized that this is what I had to do. Within a few months, I'm getting quickly to the end. Within a few months, um, I got the opportunity to go to Poland with John's church. There were hundreds of young people in John's church. And I couldn't understand why they wanted me. But I was a hairdresser and I was going to be the treat for the, the Polish trip. Because in those days, it would take a month's wages for somebody to have their hair cut. So I went, every, all the others were nurses and they could build things and do all these things, but I was the hairdresser and I went. Uh, I did know John at this point, but I have to say I didn't like John at this point. <laughs> I've really got to be, I'm not going to mess with words, I'm going to be honest. Um, because... At the time I knew John, he hadn't recommitted his life, and he seemed a bit of a big head to me, and um, just didn't do it for me. But before we went to Poland, we had, um, we had, had preparation meetings. The prepar preparation meetings turned out to be prayer meetings, because we, as young people, we couldn't stop praying. Don't ever think prayer is boring. It's as boring as you make it. It can be really, really exciting. And um, we would be there till the early hours of the morning. It was amazing. But this one night, it was the first night we were meeting together. And I was coming back from home. Uh, sorry, coming back from work in my car. And 
something happened. I can only describe it as a God thing because I was completely out of control at this point, not of the car, but of my emotions. I just started to cry because I was praying in my car, which made it difficult to see. And I can't say I fell in love with John, but love for John fell into me. And all of a sudden, I just had this amazing sense that can only have been from God, that of John Hall and the words that came out of my mouth out loud (laughs) to God was oh no not him (laughs) but it's the truth up until that point I felt nothing but the next few months were complete agony because I was so shy and um, not at all confident And in my heart of hearts, I felt, what on earth would he see in me? Because there were all these other gorgeous girls who were full of confidence, had so much to say, and were so holy. And then there was me. What the heck could he see in me? So every time he tried to talk to me, I couldn't look at him. He asked for a pencil once. I just went like that. I couldn't look because I thought what God had done in me, he would see. And if it was from God, it had to be genuine. I couldn't talk to anybody about it because it was far too precious. We went to Poland and nothing happened. But then it came to our last night and we regularly met in the evenings, got together to pray as as had become our custom. But this particular night was just amazing. The Holy Spirit was just doing stuff in us as young people. Notice I was in my 20s and I was still a young person. And something I just started to cry I if I cried in the past it would usually be in the toilet because I never liked people seeing me cry because it was something that would draw attention to you I didn't like that but I cried and I didn't know why I was crying and I couldn't control the crying and on three separate occasions that night three different people came up to me prayed for me And finished with, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And I felt like God was reassuring me because inside there was this ache for John. Nothing happened that night other than that. The next day we were on our way home and we were stopping overnight in Berlin. And we were staying in a church, and that church set up a a special meeting because they wanted to hear what our adventure in Poland had had been like. And we were all sat together. And I just happened to be sat next to John. It wasn't pre-planned or anything like that. And halfway through the service, John grabbed my hand. I could have slapped him, couldn't I, really? But I didn't. But later I found out that John had been praying a prayer and he'd messed up in his life and he had asked God that the next woman he met or girl he met, he was going to marry. He didn't want to mess around anymore. But he had been feeling feelings for me. And that night God spoke to him and he said, John, the girl you're sat next to, you're going to marry. He looked the one side and there was a guy called Dave Elston sat there. (laughs) So he was hoping it wasn't him, and the next one was me. That is our history. But it required me cooperating with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Once I'd put God where he should have been, the rest followed. It doesn't happen quickly or not as quickly as we want. By not cooperating with God in our lives, we could be missing out big time on the amazing adventure he's got for us. I want to read something from, she's a woman I listen a lot to. A lot of women don't like her tough. I think she's fantastic because she says it as it is and she is very honest about who walk with God, warts and all, and her name is Joyce Mayer, and she says this about this verse. If someone prophesies over us some wonderful things in the name of the Lord, what they say to us may express the heart and the will and the desire of God for us, but... 
that does not mean it is positively going to happen just as it is prophesied. This is because it cannot and will not come to pass if we choose to refuse to cooperate with God or to stray away from his will. God does have a plan for our lives, but we have to participate in that plan for it, can, for it to come true. God is not likely to do anything in our lives without our cooperation. You see, it takes two, baby, as the song goes. But this morning, I want to encourage you. It's not, I don't want to rip or tear or run anybody down. But I, there were four words that I think God gave me um, in my first night in hospital. And I, I took a notebook in because I didn't know what was going to happen, but I just felt I had to. And the first word that he gave me was the word investment. No one invests in anything that's worthless, except if you're a banker, I think, these days. But no one invests in anything that's worthless. And I want to tell you all this morning that God has invested greatly in your lives and in my life. He made the greatest investment he could ever make when he gave his son as a sacrifice on the cross for every single thing we have done wrong. He doesn't see you as worthless. He sees you as precious. And you know, so much of the time, we see ourselves as worthless, as useless. We listen to lies more than we listen to truth. I've never watched this program, at least not all of it, but there's a program that's called Dragon's Den on the television. I don't know if any of you watch it. I don't particularly like watching things like that because they tend to rip people's dreams apart. But I was thinking about Dragon's Den and how these people come with the things they've created, these things that are precious to them. And, they, and their hope is gone because the investors, the dragons, don't see any hope. But you know there's four dragons, and I reckon that if there was a throne by the side of them and the fifth person was God, he would never say no to you. He always says yes to you. The second word that God gave to me was the word potential. And I'm afraid that probably all of us in this room don't see our potential. If I'd had the finances, I did say to John, could we look on eBay and see if we can get some cheap mirrors? Because what I wanted is for you to look at yourself and you know what? I think if today, if we all had a mirror in front of us and made a note of what we saw, I could gar practically guarantee that there'd be more negative th things that you saw in yourself than you'd see positive. But today, I want you to start to see yourself as God sees you. You see, we listen too much to what people tell us. And so many people have told us in our lives that we are rubbish or you're going to do that. We've got to stop listening to other people and li stop listening to what the devil is whispering in our ears and start listening to what God is telling us to do. This is how God thinks of his children. In Deuteronomy, he says, of all the people on earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his special treasure. Do you feel like a treasure? People who find treasure really treasure it. And God really treasures us. We need to start to see how much God treasures us. When somebody, I remember when John would run the, um, the original Ryder Cup. The first time he brought it home, it was given to him in a Tesco bag. No one realized the value of what was in that Tesco bag. Now... If you saw what they've put it in, it's in a metal box, cushioned. It's precious. I dusted it once and the whole thing fell on the floor and it had another dent. But 
You see, when somebody realized the value of something, and God sees value in you, he is invested in you, and you have potential. The other thing that God thinks about you is in Jeremiah 31. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again. It doesn't matter what you feel like this morning, how low, how bad, how awful, but I've done this and I've done that. So what? We've all done stuff. I have loved you, God says, with an everlasting love. And I want you back. The third word, I think, God gave to me and that night was the word, oh, sorry, I'm still on potential. I'm rushing ahead. What does the dictionary say about potential? Having possibility. You have amazing possibilities. You just need to see it. We have limitless potential because we have a limitless God. And I don't think we see it. And you've got to open your eyes this morning. God has a plan. What else does my mate, Joyce Mayer, have to say? She says this. We need to cooperate with God every single day of our lives in order for our potential to be developed. Every day, we ought to learn something. Every day, we ought to grow. Every day, we ought to discover something. Every day, we ought to be a bit further along than we were the day before. We should be lifetime learners. Lifetime. It just doesn't happen for just you young people. The oldest person can still learn. We must understand that no other human being on the face of this earth can develop our potential for us. We have to do it. We must each discover our own God-given gifts and talents, what we are truly capable of, and then put ourselves to the task of developing those gifts, talents, and cooperate to, to our fullest potential. God has a plan for each of us. It is a good plan. It is an uncommon plan. It is a great plan. It is not an average, mediocre plan. And she says this, I encourage you to seek that plan and cooperate with God so that it will be wonderfully fulfilled in your life. Cooperate with God. So to, for us to have opportunity, we have to cooperate and we have to, to keep moving on. Our next word that God gave to me was our opportunity. God has a great plan for us to have a hope and a future. It means he has opened up for us a door of opportunity. What does my dictionary say the word opportunity means? It says having a favorable chance, a good chance, having an opening, a course for action to seize an opportunity. You know, a lot of us think we haven't got a lot of opportunity. A lot of us feel weak, not good enough. I don't know enough. I don't pray enough. I can't be like you. The thing is, is that God uses weak people. And he uses them for this reason because his word tells us that in our weakness, he becomes the strength. He becomes our strength. And when we don't have the strength, we can't give anyone else the credit other than God. We're not doing this. You know, this morning it was, it's been like I've been to the toilet I don't know how many times. Because you just don't feel up to it. My history tells me I shouldn't be here. Um, we were talking the other day, and if my dad saw me now, he just wouldn't probably recognize me. But it isn't me. It's Christ in me. Revelation says, I have opened a door for you that no one can shut. God has opened a door of opportunity for all of us. The trouble is, is that we stay this side of it and we don't walk through. All you've got to do is walk through. 
All you've got to do is do it. And do you know what? I think the biggest losers in the world are the people that never try. It's great if, it, if you try and it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. But having never to have tried. How frustrated God must be when he sees his church, he sees us in this room, bursting with opportunity and just too afraid and too scared to take it, too afraid of what people might say. Do you know what? We need to be more afraid of what God's going to say to us, not what people. And the Bible tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As church, we need to stop believing the lies that Satan would drip feed into us. And we've got to start believing the God who promises. When I was a little girl, there used to be a program on the television, and some of you might remember it. Opportunity Knocks. I used to love that program. And you know, some of them, they weren't very good. They were a bit hopeless. It was a bit like Britain's Got Talent only on a much smaller scale, because we had nothing that big then. And old Huey Green, he'd be there, and the people would come out and do their stuff, and then the people would vote. Who's going to go on till the next week? Opportunity is knocking at your door. And it doesn't matter whether you're the youngest person in this room or the oldest, opportunity still knocks. There's still opportunities. And you still have potential. And we're coming to the end. The last thing. I've got to say that this isn't just for you. It's for me. Because very seldom did I think anybody would invested anything in me. Very seldom did I see that I had potential or that I had opportunity. And so many things that came my way, opportunities, I just let them pass by. But the final thing I think God said to me was boldness. You know, we need to be a bit more bold. We sing the song, don't we? Be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with you. We sing it and we don't do it. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've bought you. I've bought you back. I've invested in you. I have summoned you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What a lovely verse. He doesn't just call us. He calls us by name. He knows who we are. He knows what we're like. But you know, I'm his. If you feel like you belong to nobody today, you belong to God. God wants you to belong to him and he wants him to belong to you. What does the dictionary say about boldness? It says, be courageous, enterprising, confident, to venture, vigorous, well-marked, clear, prominent. And this is the best one, fearless. I don't know how many of you feel fearless in this room today, but we can be fearless. I can be fearless when everything is not just about me but it's all about Christ and his capabilities in me. When the king of heaven says, and the creator of all that we see and is unseen, says to us, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, something has to happen that something must stir us inside. Hope and a future isn't just for the young. Hope and a future is for us whatever our age. And if we're Christ's, our future goes on till eternity. It's not, this isn't it, there's more. I want you to stand, please. And if we know God, if we are the children of God, 
No, it's not if, is it? If you've made a commitment to him, you are. We are the children of God. And we are the children of God and we have potential. We have God-given opportunity. We are children of God whom God has invested in greatly and at a huge and amazing price. And because of that, we can be bold. We can be fearless for him. I don't know how fearless you feel, but you need to be a bit more fearless. We need to move on. We need to raise the bar. We've all seen the Olympics. We've all seen these great feats that our bodies can do. Well, some people's bodies can do. But as Christians, if you are a Christian in this place today, you've got to raise the bar. Things are happening in our world that perhaps we've never seen before. The bar needs to be raised. We need to push on and push out there. There's a verse in Romans 8, 31. And it is this. And some of you will know it. And it's this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, the challenge is, is that we are going to shout it out. Because we, you can't say a verse like that quiet. You know, God is for us. And whoever and whatever comes against us, it's nothing like the power and the strength that's in our God who's in us. He lives and he breathes in us. So after three, we're going to shout this out. And if you don't shout it loud enough, we'll do it again. <laughs> so... I'll just say it one more time in case, because there, there's probably people here that have never heard it. If God is for us, who can be against us? If you don't know God, if you're not a Christian, if you've drifted away, he wants you back. And whatever comes against you, you will never be on your own. He will always be with you. He's promised that, and he isn't a liar. He can't lie. So, after three, one, two, three. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now we've just got to believe it. We've got to believe it. If God is for us, who can be against us? We're going to pray now. And do you know what we're going to do? We're going to come boldly. Because the Bible tells us that we can come boldly into his presence. Because he's dad. He wants to be our father. So, let's just close our eyes for a second. Think about this God that is invested in you. Ask yourself this question, how much have I invested in him? You see, relationship comes both ways. It's not just about God delivering all the time. We have to deliver too. And a marriage isn't just about uh, living with someone. It's about talking to someone. And God wants you to talk to him. If you've fallen away from God, he wants you back. If you've put other things in the place where God should be, he wants his rightful place back. You were a treasure to him. How dare we reject a God that calls us his treasured possession? who says that he loves us, who has given his son as a living sacrifice for us. And if you're afraid, think of what God said to Joshua. I command you, be strong, and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God 
is with you wherever you go. That's a promise to all of us if we know Jesus as our Savior. If you're living for him, if you're cooperating with him, he is with you. He is with us wherever we go. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing love towards us. Oh God, Father, we thank you that you have invested in us and for us, and not just for us in this room, for every living person that has ever been or will be. Your promise is for everyone who accepts you. Father God, we thank you that this morning we can stand here and we can know that you're a God who sees a people with immense potential, with amazing opportunities. Father God, I pray in your name that as your people we will start to see ourselves as you see us and stop believing the lie and stop saying we can't because we have a can-do God. And Father God, I pray in your name that as your children we will be bold not because of the confidence we have in ourselves but because of the confidence we find in you. We can be confident in you not in our abilities, but what you plant and sow through us. Oh God, we pray that we will take on board that if we're your children today, if God is for us, who can be against us? And may we be people that will raise the bar, will go that little step higher, because God, you're a God who deserves all the praise. You deserve the sacrifice of our lives. Father, thank you for loving us, for giving your son for our sin and for giving us a hope that someday in the future, if we're your children, we will be where you are. Thank you for the promise of heaven. We thank you for those words, for I know the plans that I have for you. It is plans to prosper you and not to harm you. It is a plan to give you a hope and a future. Father God, we thank you that you offer far more than what our world offers. And we thank you that that word goes on to say, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And Father, we thank you for the promise that comes ne next. And you say, I will listen to you. Father, may we pray, may we talk to you, because we know you will listen. You will seek me and find me. Bethany, when you seek him with all your heart. Father, may we be your people who will seek you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.